Welcome to Stories, an Institute podcast, where we interview amazing seminary and institute teachers about stories found in the scriptures, discuss life challenges, and highlight amazing young adults who love the Lord Jesus Christ and His Church. I'm your host, Steve Livingston. Stories podcast. We're going to continue after the first of the year, focusing on uh, the Book of Mormon uh, as we move into the the new uh, material for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. And so good to be moving into the Book of Mormon. But uh, let's finish off this year with uh, with Christmas and uh, come follow me next week. And we're going to have a couple of amazing episodes where we're going to split this interview uh, that uh, that I did with uh, somebody super fab tabulous who is like Yo Yo Ma. When it comes to being on the uh, on the cello, she's amazing. And uh, but first, I want to just share a Christmas story with you today, uh, one that's come to my recent attention, uh, called "The Miracle of the Pink Christmas Tree," and it's by uh, uh, Sunny Mahe. It's a real personal story. Um, in a lot of ways, it's a real difficult story, but it shows exactly the reality of focusing on our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that you can have joy no matter what the circumstances are. And so in this particular story shared by Sunny Mahe, uh, she says, I have a pink Christmas tree. Three short years ago, I would have thought it was gaudy and ridiculous, but today it represents to me the best things about Christmas miracles love for one another, and most of all, the Savior. The story of my pink tree begins with my three-year-old daughter named Elsie. My Elsie was innocently naughty in all the best ways. She brought home fistfuls of neighbor's flowers. She constantly snuck into my craft room to dump glitter onto her head, and one time she set a neighbor's chickens free. (laughs) She was packed to the brim with life and laughter. On November 22, 2016, Elsie became entangled in a cord from our window blinds. When I found her, I screamed her name, quickly took her down, and started CPR. She smelled like chocolate, and she must have she must have snuck a snack from the pantry. I sent my son to get help. My neighbor came and administered a priesthood blessing. I remember feeling relief when Elsie took that first ragged breath, and her heart began to beat again under my chest compressions. The paramedics swept in and took over the life-saving efforts, and Elsie was flown in a helicopter to the hospital. For a week at the hospital, she alternatingly showed signs of progress, followed by decline. But behold, I will show unto you a God of miracles. There were many miracles surrounding her accident. When I sent my son to get help, my neighbor just happened to be running a little late for work. He just happened to be already already have consecrated oil in his pocket to quickly administer a priesthood blessing. The paramedics were stationed about 15 minutes away, but they just happened to be on a break at a store only three minutes from my home. And I was somehow able to per- perfectly administer CPR. I had never done CPR before, but I started Elsie's heart. When I got to the hospital, Elsie was responding to light and pain, which was good. But she was also experiencing rhythmic, uncontrollable twitches that are common in anoxic brain injuries. She was fevering, and her heart was unnaturally high. On top of all that, Elsie was breathing over the ventilator, meaning that for every breath that the vent would give, she would take another on her own, panting like a dog. But then her siblings came to visit. They talked to her quietly. They painted her nails and painted theirs to match. When it came time to leave, they sang her, sang to her, families can be together forever. As they sang, her heart rate returned to a normal pace. Her temperature came down. Her breathing slowed. Her twitches stopped and never came back. Another miracle. Because of these miracles, I felt we had every reason to hope for even an even big, bigger miracle, a full recovery to show forth the Lord's power to heal. But when Elsie's scans came back, they showed very little brain activity and even that was beginning to decline. We fled to the temple to seek clarity and peace. In the temple, we received the strong impression that Elsie would not live. I was devastated and felt like such a failure. Why was I able to save her only to have her die? Where was my miracle? Elsie became the missing miracle. The life-saving miracle we had pleaded for would not be for Elsie, but instead for Elsie to others 
through the miracle of organ donation. She would give to those whose missions here were not yet finished, and she would leave this earth as a life-saving hero. Our pain will become another's joy. Love for one another. A different kind of miracle was happening at our house during the week we spent in the hospital. I wondered how I could ever feel safe in my own home again. How could I come back to the scene of the worst moment of my life? My wonderful neighbors knew that they could not fix our broken hearts, so they came to my home to fix many other broken things as they could find, and they didn't have to look too far to find them. The first round of neighbors vacuumed floors, washed dishes, tidied up toys, and cleaned bathrooms. As more people learned of the service being done, the miracle grew. Furniture was replaced, walls were painted, new decor and lamps were donated, and sinks and appliances were t- turned, tuned up or fixed. My friends, neighbors, and even strangers went to work transforming my home until it was bursting at the seams with Christ-like love and service. When we drove home from the hospital for the final time, we found the streets of our neighborhood lined with hundreds of candles lighting our path. It was bitterly cold, yet dozens of neighbors stood outside to sing comforting hymns to us. Many trees were strung with pink lights or tied with pink ribbons, Elsie's favorite color. No one asked me what I needed. I wouldn't have known what to ask for, and I never would have asked for all that I received. But each person came and offered whatever they could to bless our family and to ease our burden. They were beacons of light during our darkest hour. The Lord's hands, they were in our darkest hour, the Lord's hands here on earth. One of the things I remember most about that long week is the overwhelming peace that we felt. As we fasted and prayed for peace, it was liberally given. We came to understand what is meant by the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Because of Jesus Christ, we are able to feel peace even in sorrow. Above all else, my family has more reason now to feel gratitude that Jesus was born. Everything really will be okay in the end because he was born. His birth overcame Elsie's death. Because of our Savior, we will see Elsie again and will be an eternal family. We long for the Savior's return with more eagerness. We live with more hope in our hearts, and we remember with more reverence that he gave his life that we might live again. He is the light in the life of the world. In my neighborhood at Christmas time, many yards will have one tree adorned in pink lights. It used to make me feel so happy that Elsie was remembered and honored, but I see now that the real reason for the pink trees is that Elsie helped others remember Christ. Serve as Christ served and love as he loved. She helps us remember that because he came, we will see our loved ones again. Because those pink trees remind us, remind me of him, they have become the classiest decoration I could possibly have in my home. If you ever happen to see a pink Christmas tree this year, I hope it will remind you of the Savior and maybe of a way that you, too, can light the world this Christmas. Okay, everybody, let's uh, jump into the second half of our podcast today, which is with a speckled... Spe- <laughs> That's funny. A special guest. Uh, her name is po- Pono Santos, and uh, she's amazing. Let's start off by listening to one of her songs. She actually played for uh, this song for me in my little studio here, and it's amazing. It's a song by Bach, and let's, let's listen to that. It's a couple minutes long, and then we'll jump into our interview with uh, Pono Santos. Thank you. 
All right, everybody, welcome to the uh, Stories Podcast. This is like episode 33, 34, but this is the, this, a special episode. I told you about this, that it was coming. In fact, uh, Pona was here right now, and she didn't know that I was announcing it beforehand, but I'm way excited about this. So uh, we, because it's Christmas time, we decided we were going to do something about music. And uh, we have the expert on music, at least I think so. And uh, so, Pona, why don't you introduce yourself? And, and then also, Zoe's here. You're going to say hi, Zoe, or you're just going to look. Zoe's the one with the rabbit. You all know about that. So <laughs> we're going to make her world famous for her unclean rabbit, but uh, she doesn't know that yet. So, Pono, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're here at uh, Florida State University and what you're studying and family, that kind of stuff. Just introduce yourself. Okay, cool. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Pono Santos, and I am originally from Seattle area, Washington, um, but I got my undergrad at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, so I moved out to Florida from Provo, actually. Um, drove across the country with my mom, and we drove all the way out to Tallahassee from there. And um, I have been playing cello now for 18 years, so for most of my life. Oh, that's um, incredible. Yeah, and it's been a huge part of my life, and I love it so much, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else, and I feel very blessed that I get to do it every day. Um, And that's actually why I'm here at Florida State is because I am studying um, to get my master's at Florida State. I'm in my second year and I have about one more semester to go. So I'm almost done, which is crazy. It goes so fast. You only get two years for your master's. So it flies by. Um, What are you going to do when you're when you're done? Are you going to stay here for a PhD type of thing or what are you going to do when you're done? I'm still deciding. I, it's very possible that I will apply for a doctorate program here at Florida State. Um, it's a great music program, great music school. Um, so that's definitely a possibility, but I'm also going to audition at other schools. Um, University of Kentucky is one that I'm interested in as well as University of Maryland. Um, so, and then there's a couple others that I still want to look into. So, I'll take a year off next year, and I'll just be gigging and teaching in the area, doing lots of cello stuff without the school, which I'm actually really excited about. Um, and then I'll start auditioning for doctorate programs next year. So none of you are here in our little studio uh, as we were watching her. You, you heard at the very beginning just a small piece, and we're going to play in, in just a few minutes um, the whole piece that she played from Bach, right? What? Tell me what number that was that you were... <laughs> It's not a number. It's a. It's a well. It's the prelude from his first suite in G major. Okay, there yeah. you go. See, I'm so educated. I wouldn't even know that, but uh, you could tell that you, you're pretty passionate. So it, it, you're kind of excited just to be able to play music and not have to go through all the hoops and everything with schoolwork yeah. and everything like that. So mm-hmm. very, fun. very cool. I keep calling her uh, Yo Yo Ma because that's the only one I know that plays the cello. <laughs> but uh, someday when she's rich and famous, I told her not to forget the little people. So. Yeah, my friends call me Popo Ma sometimes. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> It's a joke. <laughs> That's amazing. It's yeah. not my favorite nickname. It's but not your favorite <laughs> nickname. But it's pretty funny. It should be, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I know. That'll always be in my mind. That's yeah. right. we got to hold on to that. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Um, 
So 18 years of playing the cello, is yeah. this something that your parents decided or are you just like, I want to get into doing music? And So my parents decided kind of music for me. We, well, we always grew up singing and stuff. So my first memories actually are going caroling with my family. Um, and when I was like two years old, we'd go out carol um, in the cold. <laughs> it didn't usually snow, but it was usually like wet and rainy and cold in Seattle. Um, and we'd go singing um, to our friends' houses and people in our ward and like friends from school and stuff like that. Um, and then a couple years after that, when I was five or six or so, I started piano lessons and that was definitely forced. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I didn't really like it and I was being stubborn and my mom was being stubborn, but eventually she was like, you know what? If you're not going to practice, I'm not going to pay for lessons. So she finally let me quit after a while and that's actually one of my biggest life regrets i wish i played piano better um but i started cello um in fifth grade and that was just orchestra in fifth grade um and i had heard it around the house because well i'd heard string instruments around the house because um, my oldest sister played violin and my older brother played cello and i just really liked the sound of the cello and how it sounded um so yeah so i picked it up as soon as i could in fifth grade orchestra and i started then and then i started taking private lessons a couple years later in seventh grade actually so so uh, what, you know, we have uh, here at the uh, Florida State University, uh, Dr. Erickson. Do you know him? He's uh, wrote that book about peak. It's all about uh, practice and uh, intentional. He doesn't call it intentional practice. It's um, any, anyway, I, my question, I guess, is, is that he, uh, he talks about how every time you go to practice, you try to push yourself to do just a little bit more than you already know how to do. And so that's a, that whole 10,000 hours uh, idea that if you can do something for 10,000 hours, but it's deliberate practice for that 10,000 hours. It's not just doing something over and over again for hours and hours, but you're deliberate about it. So what have you learned about, I'm just thinking about practice from the time that you actually started, where it was just kind of like, I have to practice, to now when it comes to, I really want to be good. I really want to make a difference. I want people to feel something like when they you play your music what have you learned about practice um well it's definitely been a process like you said I feel like when I started out it was mostly just me playing through stuff and trying to get through um the music and the notes I was playing but um the older and more experienced I've gotten um kind of like you were saying I realized it's about improvement it's about getting better and progressing um, so that means when I go into a practice room, I don't sit down and start from the beginning necessarily and just play through things. I'll usually like, I know the hard spots that I can't quite play yet. And those are the spots that I'll usually go to first and I'll attack those first, um, with the hope of seeing improvement how, after however long I get the chance to practice for. Um, so I'll start with the hard stuff and I'll start there. Um, and I use metronomes, a lot of different tools like that, that help push me so that I can get better. And I usually like with something fast, um, even that Bach, it's not super fast, but even with something like that, you start it slowly and then you kind of have to build up to where you can play it in tempo. Um, and that's especially true of like the fast, tricky stuff, whether it be in solo music or orchestra or chamber or whatever. Do you ever, do you tech life that same way too? I'm just curious if you like, uh, you, nobody likes to tackle the hard stuff, but I mean, do you actually look at it and, and like, I'm, I'm going to deal with the hard stuff first and then, or do you ever go at it like that? Do you ever think about it that way at all? Yeah, I think I do. For, um, I do better at it um, at different parts, points in my life, I think. Uh, like exercise, for example, that's something that sometimes I'm really good at waking up and going running and other times I'm just like, I don't want to do that today. Um so that's an example of something that's hard that I'll be like, I have to do this because I know it's good and I know it will help me. Um, but yeah, and then even like homework, um, I'll usually I'll usually start with the stuff that's more difficult. Like for example, this last semester I had a lot of music history reading um, and that was really hard for me because I'm used to playing uh, cello and not having to read as much um, but I had a ton of reading this semester for this one class um, so I would usually start with that um, as I started my homework so that I could get that done first and get it out of the way. Interesting as you th as you think about growth I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump into this quote that I, I don't think I, I wasn't planning on actually uh, sharing but uh, I think that it's 
what you have learned some people don't learn this in life because they don't either play a sport or they do something. To, <clears throat> so you're talking about books, right? Mm -hmm. And not really being into books, but actually the actual practice of the cello. So I want, I, I'm want i curious about what you both think about this quote. It says, this is Elder Hafen from the Quorum of the Seventy. He said, there are two kinds, two different kinds of knowledge. One involves such rational processes as gathering information and memorizing. The other kind of knowledge I would call skill development. Learning how to do something like playing the piano or swimming or taking a car engine apart, learning to sing or dance or think. That last one's always interesting to me. Um, the process of becoming Christ-like is a matter of acquiring skills more than a matter of learning facts and figures. And there is, not, there is something about the nature of developing those divine skills that makes it impossible even for God to teach us those things unless we participate in the process. We shouldn't expect it to be otherwise. With piano, with piano, with a piano teacher, um, it says, "What piano teacher could teach people to play if they were unwilling to practice? What coach can improve the capacity of an athlete without supervising the athlete, athlete's own trials and errors?" But they say that developing Christ-like attributes is more like skill development. What are your what What are your thoughts about that? Any you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I. I really love that quote. Um, I was just trying to relate, like, the first part of that quote, thinking about, like, memorization and learning in that way and then skills and character um, and trying to relate that to, like, things in my life. Like, okay, what have I, like, learned by just memorizing things and then what are some things that I've, like, really had to work at and then thinking of those things that I've really had to work at in my life, I think that those are the ones that I'm more passionate about and the things that, like, I feel more accurately like define me and so putting that into the context of the gospel I think um, it's just interesting to think about how we do need to acquire skills and learn and practice how we can become Christ-like and that then it's a little bit more meaningful than just like memorizing a scripture or something you know yeah. not, not that memorizing scriptures isn't good because it is but but you know what I mean? It's it's like, would you rather memorize the scripture or would you rather like take the principle of that scripture and apply it in your life and become like that? So. Yeah, I can understand that completely. Bono, what do you think? Um, yeah, kind of like Zoe was saying, I think that um, the Savior really was a good example of that, of acquiring um, skills and knowledge. I love that. Um, I just watched the new... Uh, Christmas video, and that super good, huh? Yeah, so yeah, good. Yeah. I loved it. It's great. Everyone should watch it. Plug, but um, <laughs> but I l just loved like even when the wise men came and Jesus was a little bit older, um, but he was still so young. He was I don't know probably two or three. It seemed like on based on the depiction, um, and he was just so young and so innocent. And these wise men were like bowing down to him, and he kind of just like there's this part where he just like looks at his mom and like smiles, and he had like no idea what was happening. You know, he didn't know what was going on or why these people were bowing to him um but i loved that he learned and that he uh, um grew to understand you know his role on this earth and i think that the same can be said for us as we work to acquire those skills and as we try to develop our talents um i feel like a lot of this whole talent business is a little crazy I mean I don't know I think yes we do have gifts that we're given and stuff um, but I also think that a lot of what we're able to do on earth um, comes from the work that we put into it and relying on the Lord to strengthen us and to make us capable to um, acquire the skills that we need to acquire that even we want to acquire um, and I have a story about that. I don't know if we have enough time. Oh, we got plenty of time. Okay. So just, yeah, because <laughs> I, I love what you're sharing because okay. I think it's 100% true. So yeah, in my own going. life. Um, so I didn't always used to be like super good. I was kind of like spread out all over the place in high school, actually. And I didn't know that I wanted to study music until I got to college. Um, so I'm going to go all the way back. So <laughs> I did not get into BYU 
uh, Provo, but that's where I wanted to go. That's where all my siblings had gone, and I just like really wanted to go there. I got into Idaho, but I was like, I don't think I'm going to go there. So I literally moved down to Provo for summer semester as a visiting student and took classes that first summer. Still wasn't in the program, uh, I mean in the school, but... Um, but I moved down and did that and didn't really have a plan after that. But I talked to a counselor when I got down there and I found out that my ACT score was a little lower than what it needed to be with the combination of my GPA and my extracurriculars. Um, so I retook the ACT a couple times actually because I had to get it up to a certain score. Um, and then I got in for that winter. While this was all going on, I was down there, I was playing cello, I started taking lessons with a graduate student. Um, and I decided that I wanted to audition for the music program that January. Um, so that January that I got into BYU was my audition for the School of Music. Um, I auditioned that year and I didn't get in. I was like really close, but there were a lot of really good freshmen that were coming in that next year. Um, and I was like devastated. I, I like had prayed about it and I just really felt good about the whole music thing, but I didn't get in. So I was like, dang it, like what am I supposed to do now, Heavenly Father? Um, and I decided that I was going to wait another year. So that whole next year, I like devoted my life to cello playing. Did you hear uh, that the whole next year? Yeah. I, I do my, my son's listening to this. I'm like, <laughs> she, she doesn't give up. She says, okay, for another year, I'm going to get down to business. Yeah. I love this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it's hard at BYU because there's not a ton of practice rooms. So they're usually filled during the day. So I would literally wake up at five in the morning so I could go practice at 6 a.m. in the HVAC. Um, and then there would be some days that I would close it at 11. It's open from 6 a.m. to 11. And I would sometimes be on both ends of those hours because that's when the rooms were available. Um, but for that whole next year, I practiced like a music major at least three hours a day. Um, I also went to the cello professor and asked her if I could sit in on master class every week, which is like the cello group class. And I was like, I know, like I'm not in the studio, but I just really love like to be here and learn and stuff. So she agreed to that. She's like, you can't play because you're not in the studio, but you can come watch. So I was like, great, that's awesome. Um, so I went every week for a year to observe master class as well as I was practicing and getting ready and taking lessons. Um, I gave a recital at the end of that year, my first uh just me recital so that was exciting um and then that next january i auditioned again for the program um and i got in that time and it was such hard work but so exciting um to have finally been able to get in and then after that i was like i'm good i'm in the program it'll be great that next fall i auditioned for the highest orchestra at byu which is byu philharmonic I mean, I didn't get in. And again, devastated. I was like, I'm in the program now. Why did I not get into the orchestra? <laughs> um, but I kept working, kept practicing. Um, and I auditioned for the concerto competition at the end of that fall semester. Um, and I got to the semifinals and I got to play for the conductor of Philharmonic. Um, and I didn't make it to the finals, but he heard me play. And Later, I found out that one of my cello friends who was in Philharmonic was going on a study abroad to Vienna. So I literally sent him an email. His name is Corey Katsianis. And I was like, hey, Corey, um, I have a question for you. I was wondering if there was a time I could come and talk to you about it. Um, so he replied and said, yes, this time works. So I went up to his office and I was like, so I know I didn't get into the Philharmonic at the beginning of fall semester, but I heard that Christina was leaving to go on a study abroad. Are you holding an audition for her chair? Because I'd really like to audition for that. Um, and he's like, no, but it's yours. You got it. Like, I heard you play for the concerto competition. So you're good. And yeah. Look at you and just go. Come That's <laughs> awesome. The Philharmonic <laughs> See, next this dog of determinedness <laughs> just so, to make it happen. Yeah. You don't give up on your dreams. I love it. Yep. And then, yeah. And then I ended up um, being principal of Philharmonic before I graduated from BYU, a principal of BYU Chamber Orchestra of BYU Baroque Ensemble um, before I left. Um, and this was all after my mission, after coming back. Um, but I, thanks to um, skill development, which I also like calling hard work and the Lord's help and hand in my life, um, I was able to overcome these 
difficulties and challenges. And I was also able to help others along the way who are maybe experiencing some similar things, like not getting into an orchestra they wanted or something like that, which I think the Lord was able to do a lot of in his life too. He was there to comfort and lift and help people because he knew what they were going through. Um, and I think that that comes along with skill development as well. I, uh, I'm so glad you shared that because I, you know, Paul, I've been talking to a lot of people lately and a lot of people pray for the wrong thing. They are always praying for their situation to change. And, and I just, and I'm like, you're praying for the wrong thing. You need to pray for the strength from the savior that you can make it through and deal with what you're dealing with. And he'll, it's his strength that you need to ask for and he'll give it to you to make it through and do what you need to do to take the next step and whatever you're, that you're going through or trying to accomplish or anything like that and and i think that that's a mistake we get stuck in this pattern of praying for a result that's already a result you can't really change that result in the moment right if it's a banana tree and you want it to be an apple tree you got to plant a new seed or just go back to work and yeah. cultivate it kind of like you did and so i just i love what you what you just shared so Thanks. that's just super super good so thank you for sharing that i appreciate okay. it i um I want I want to share a quote with you that's it might be my favorite quote about music and um and this is uh President Reuben uh Clark Jr who is also big and uh kind of gave one of the foundational talks for seminary and institutes but his he says this we get nearer to the Lord through music than perhaps through any other thing except prayer and uh I have in my own life, when I worked out at the Utah Broys Ranch, when I would, I would talk to the kids that had really gone away, um, and I said, what are the things that really pulled you away from um, living the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the number one thing was always their friends. The things that they started to do, like uh, alcohol and drugs and the addictions and any kind of immorality and stuff like that, wasn't what they said. It was their friends that they got hooked up with that led to making those decisions. But what was always interesting to me was, I said, well, what's the second thing? Every time, music. Huh. And I, there was no prompt. There was no, I would say, they would tell me, the other thing that pulled me away is that once I had these set of friends, I started to listen to the wrong kind of music. And that wrong kind of music didn't invite the Spirit of the Lord and pulled them away even farther. And it always... It, it, over the two years that I worked there, every time they would say that exact same thing. And I don't know why it was always friends and then music, but they would, the ones that have really kind of struggled with really hard, hard things always said those two things. And wow. so I really believe that there's really amazing, inspirational music that really invites the spirit of the Lord, but then there's music that can really draw somebody away and pull them away. What are your, what are your thoughts? Both of you probably have. Okay, that was uh, part one with Pono Santos. Stay tuned for next uh, week's podcast with Pono Santos when we do part two talking about uh, inspirational music. Have a great day.